Everything that is built is designed by mathematics. In this film, we meet three young structural engineers who work for the Walsh Group to find out how important their role is. When architects have their vision of building up something, they have a plan of what they, it will look like, but they don't actually know how it would actually be done physically. For them, it's about how good it looks, how it would affect the surrounding area and things like that, and how it's going to work with the entire planning scheme. Whereas like, for us, we make that dream come true. This is what I think, because we make it happen by using mathematics. We um, derive everything from first principles. We're the people, we're the problem solvers. I'd say the structural engineer, the key thing is that we basically make sure that the building stands up. The structural engineer is responsible for the design of all structural elements. We use maths in every single step along the way. In the initial stages, you're doing primarily the design, so you're working out the sizes, and then from then you'll be marking up drawings to give to, to technicians to get the drawings built. We're just behind Canary Wharf. This is a, a new build, it's going to be six blocks. Um, it's reinforced concrete, so you've got your concrete and you've got your, your steel reinforcement in there as well. No two buildings are the same. If it was the case that oh, we could standardise everything, then our lives would be, would be too easy. On every project, there's, there's different constraints that we, that we need to work to. Um, in London, lots of the work that we do are over the underground, so especially with the foundations, that obviously we've got a responsible for the design of those. It's quite, it's quite difficult changing the building to suit where you can put your foundations. Foundation is actually the, one of the most difficult part of, uh, of any construction project because once it's outside the ground, you can design it however you want, but inside the ground, there's this amount of risk, that uncertainty that no one will ever know unless you dug inside and you have to use your engineering expertise, experience to predict what's the best to be done. The building is standing on piles connected by pile caps, which then the, the whole building slow is spread onto these caps to the piles deep into the ground. Over there you have the pile caps with the rebar sticking out. That's uh, for the shear walls or the concrete columns to transfer the load onto. So imagine like a tabletop. If you have a tabletop uh, flat flat slab and then you have all these columns supporting it the load got to go somewhere and that's where the load is transferred to and then once it get, it's gets out of the ground it's a much simpler type of construction you have a reinforcement laid down and then concrete poured on top and then it's pretty much step construction We're standing at the 10th floor of a 22-storey tower. It's going to be flat, so we're standing in somebody's living room here. The structural engineer needs to design the columns to and the walls to assist the vertical loads, and the slab spans over these columns and walls. So if you imagine you've got four pencils and a piece of paper on them, if you're standing in the middle of it, the, slab, the, the piece of paper is going to bend. As We've got to design that slab so it's strong enough to resist the loads. So of, of us standing on, on the slab and also make sure that it doesn't move too much. So we've got to calculate the thickness of the slab and how much reinforcement is, goes in the slab. And we need to make sure that we do that in a cost-effective way to save the client money. If you're building only a one-storey building or two storeys, then wind is not so much of a factor. But well, if you go to medium rise to high rise structure, it is uh, one of the most vital um, things you have to consider. And in London, the basic wind velocity would be about 22 meters per second. That would translate to about one kilonewton per meter square. Imagine one meter cube sideways, you chuck a big fat like rugby player across that space. That's the wind low you roughly get. So what we have is core walls that resist the wind loading and makes the building stand upright. So if you imagine like 
Um, in nature, you have a tree. When the wind blows on that, it doesn't fall over because it's got its roots on the foundations, and the core is a stiff element which which keeps it upright. And that's the same thing with the building. The cladding that goes around it is just to make it's just an aesthetic point of view. The main thing is the structure. That's the key thing to the building. I mean, we could make them not move. We tend to design buildings that they, they've got a little bit of movement. Um, it's a total height divided by 500. So the last project I worked on was, was 27 stories. Um, and I think that moved to about 100, 150 mil, so 15 centimeters. Um, as I say, you could design it so it didn't move, but it would be very cost effective. Um, you'd end up with quite an expensive building. The third stage of the construction, once all the structural element is completed, would be to have all the insulation, waterproofing, and cladding installed. Also, you've got like plumbing, electricity, the building has to be functional. So that would be the final stage of a build. There are lots of things that could be done, like for cladding wise, you can use different color, different type of materials to help your structure, to make the foundation smaller to save money, to make the column smaller so you can have more room in your living space. Um, and once that is all cladded up, then it's ready. When it comes to building, there's generally three things which need to be brought in mind. That's uh, cost, aesthetics and safety. And it's always a case of trying to get the balance of all three, because you can make things very cheaply, but it'd be very ugly. Um, you could make things very slender, but it probably wouldn't stand up. The architects come in with a preliminary scheme, but it has to be at a reasonable cost. If something is going to be very difficult to build or uh, hugely expensive, we do talk with the architects and the client to come up with the best compromise. This is a typical architect's drawing, and we try and get in column grids and wall grids as best we can to suit the layouts because you don't want columns in the middle of rooms, you want them hidden away so you can't see them. So in this case we found a spot here, 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 and then we make this lifts and stair cores out of um, concrete which all helps. But you notice down in the basement the architects have got their stair core just stopping. But we can't really have cores just stopping, so we've sent, sent them a sketch back to say we need this down here. And they'll take that on board and um, change their layouts to suit, to help them out here so we didn't block off these car parking spaces. We've got this wall sitting on two columns either end, so they can still use it. There's quite a long old process where um, sketches are being sent back and forth between the architect until we come up with a scheme that works. The next step is we, uh, we start doing calculations on how big everything needs to be. The type of mass we use is, is very wide ranging actually. I mean, um, for example, when you're setting things out on site, it's all about angles because they have fixed points and through trigonometry you can, you can work out where things need to be, how tall things are and all sorts. To do the actual design of the structural elements or the, the slabs and the columns as a whole is an awful lot of algebra and um, it's not as complicated as you may think it is. This is a computer model of one of the slabs we're using like a reinforced concrete slab. All these uh, little green dots they're all the columns, these are walls and then this is just a slab which is just deflecting in between. This is like the biggest span here so it's got the biggest deflection. It's important to get the deflection right. There's limits, because if it deflects too much, people start getting a bit nervous. And if you put any marbles down or anything, they'll fall towards the middle of the floor. This is a basic 3D view of a building. And you can see what we put in. There's a wall here, and there's actually two cores there and there. I know they only look like lines at the moment, but they are big, chunky bits of concrete. And the reason for this one is to work out deflections because you, you have to limit the deflections at the top. And here this shows the wind blowing from the north and you can see that's the structure there and then it just deflects out that way. And that's probably like a gale force wind coming off there. Obviously this is not to scale. And we worked to a deflection of height over 500. So in this case, if we work out, it is 47 meters high. So that would equate to about 100 millimetres at the top. 
Computers are very useful, but we only ever use them as a tool because um, if you get put rubbish in, you get rubbish out. We do a huge amount by hand because quite often it's, it's quicker <laughs> in a lot of cases. When things are quite simple, a computer can sort of almost read too much into it. I've been involved in about nine, nine to ten projects, uh, various different sizes. The good thing with Walsh is you get uh, like an attempt or you get involved with different types of construction. So even when you're just talking about buildings, I've been involved in concrete structures, steel frames, timber structure, masonry, from traditional to the, you know, the latest. It's nice to have a mix. It's quite challenging stuff because every day you're dealing with different types of problems. I think they're getting there, there are more and more girls nowadays. At the end of the day, it's not just about their physical strength of what you can do, it's about here. If you have done your study, if you have built up your knowledge to carry out you know, an operation, doesn't matter what sex you are, you can just do the job just as well. I would say 80%, 90% of my time, I sit in the office. I do the design where I try to coordinate projects to make it happen. But then you also get the fun side of going on site and seeing what you have designed being built, and that's the most um, satisfying thing. I think the key requirements are you need to, to like maths, but I think from a day-to-day -day point of view, you need to be quite organised. We've obviously got a very tight programme for the, the construction programme. You need to make sure you get your work done on time. Um, and be quite creative as well, so you try and find the right solution to a problem. There's always issues which crop up, which uh, takes a bit of fast thinking. If you don't do it straight away, it can hold the whole project up. And when you're talking about a big site, you could, you could be talking about 50, 100 people all waiting for your decisions. There's a lot of things that you have to concentrate on. You need to, you need to have good coordination with the architects, the contractors, and also like, you need to look after the client's interests as well. So juggling different like, you know, things at the same time sometimes can be quite stressful. But at the end of the day, once it worked out, it's a fantastic feeling. Yeah, it's, it's extremely satisfying, definitely. I mean, just driving down the road the other day and went past my first project. Um, I was with my mates and I was like, oh yeah, I waited on that, that building. It's 26 storeys, it's the highest one in, in this area. It's extremely satisfying and rewarding. Well, it is satisfying when you're going down the road and you do see your finished product at the end. And it is a big old size. And also even going down to site is nice as well, just uh, seeing 50 odd people working away on stuff you've done personally. There's very big employment prospects, there's always building going on and even now there's not enough people going into it so the opportunities are going to keep getting bigger. People always see maths and sciences as a sad thing to do and um, it's kind of stuck and it's quite hard to get rid of but actually the actual job itself and going down that path is actually very interesting and very rewarding.